20 years ago, the Hendrick Motorsports plane crash happened outside of Martinsville. Tony Stewart said he's getting out of NASCAR because he doesn't like the direction that it's going. John Force is headed back to the NHRA track as a spectator. And NASCAR responds to the 2311 lawsuit, and they said some things. <laughs> Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. Before we get into today's news, a few house cleaning items. First up is this. This is an out of the groove daily downforce diecast, a car that was supposed to race at Homestead this upcoming weekend with Dawson Cram. Instead, unfortunately, that deal fell apart, but it does have the Break Hard logo on it. I know, it's very exciting. Let me get it out of the package here. Two hours later. That took exceptionally longer than I anticipated, but if you look on the deck lid, come a little bit closer real quick, you can see the BH logo on the deck lid. Very cool. Would have been very cool to see this car race in person. Obviously, other things happen. That's racing. Hopefully, we'll be on a car again someday. Uh, but this car will be available or is available for purchase right now. The link is down in the description from Daily Downforce. A purchase of this car um, does give a donation to Toys for Tots as well as a car to Toys for Tots as well. But very cool that we're included on this. Learn more about it uh, in the description below. Also, does anybody have a hookup or know somebody that owns a screen printing company, potentially maybe even a company that can embroider some hats? Because uh, right now, as some of you know, you can go to the uh, store link. It's in my bio on TikTok. I'll link it down here below. I really enjoy the store that I have set up. And right now it's kind of hands off for me. It's print on demand, but I would like to have all of that in house and be able to control that and ship it out when I want to. I don't like how long it takes sometimes for some of these items to be shipped out. And for the hats, uh, I got a sample last week. I'm okay with it. I'm not in love with it. Uh, so I would like to be able to have that. So if you know somebody, you have a company that does it or can point me in the direction of somebody that's maybe in the motorsport space. Uh, yeah, go ahead and give me a comment. Give me a DM on TikTok, on Twitter, whatever that may be, or even shoot me an email that is also in the bio as well. And the last thing before we get into today's actual news, remember how IndyCar CEO Mark Miles said that Pato Award just wasn't popular enough for IndyCar to have a race down in Mexico? Well, Pato was at a Mexico City mall on uh, Wednesday, and this is the photo of it. I think it's safe to say he's probably popular enough to have a race down there in Mexico, and it feels like that was maybe just a cop-out from the IndyCar staff. Pato Award, incredibly popular. No other IndyCar driver is getting that type of fan response anywhere they go in the world except for Pato Award. Nobody's getting that response in America. Nobody's getting that response wherever they may go. 20 years ago today, a Hendrick Motorsports plane crashed into Bull Mountain in Stewart, Virginia, en route to the Blue Ridge Airport outside of Martinsville, Virginia. That plane was carrying 10 members of the Hendrick Motorsports or Hendrick adjacent uh, family. Ricky Hendrick was on the plane. Rick Hendrick's son, John Hendrick, team president at the time, brother of Rick Hendrick, his two twin daughters also on the plane. Legendary engine builder Randy Dorton on the plane as well. Hendrick Motorsports general manager Jeff Turner, the two pilots, as well as a DuPont executive and Tony Stewart's pilot all passed away on Sunday, October 24th, 2004. Jimmy Johnson actually went on to win the race that day, leading 67 laps and getting himself back into the championship conversation as he and Jeff Gordon attempted to try to chase down Kurt Busch in that 2004 championship battle. A really good one, too, honestly, if you want to go back and re-watch it. But instead of, you know, circling around the racetrack and coming back to the front stretch to celebrate. Obviously, as everybody knows, at Martinsville, you celebrate on the front stretch there. You get the grandfather clock and all the things. Jimmy Johnson instead went to the infield and all the Hendrick Motorsports cars followed him and all the Hendrick Motorsports staff did. And they were informed of what had happened earlier in the day. Later that night on October 24th, uh, search crews finally reached the crash site and they were able to, you know, recover the 10 bodies or the wreckage rather and identify that there were no survivors of this plane crash. So a lot of people probably wonder, why is Martinsville so pivotal in the Hendrick Motorsports story? Why does Hendrick Motorsports put so much effort into Martinsville? Well, it's been the side of some of the highest of highs for them. They have, for, of course, got their first NASCAR Cup Series win there with Jeff Bodine back in 1984. And then they got Jeff Gordon's last win for him back in 2015. And then, of course, it also is side of the lowest of lows. Obviously, Rick Hendrick losing his brother, his son, his nieces, and some longtime players partners um, on the business side in that plane crash. It's part of the Hendrick Motorsports stories, and the always in our hearts decal went on the hood of those Hendrick Motorsports cars for the rest of the season. And like I said, Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson gave Kurt Busch a heck of a run for his money uh, to win that championship in 2004. Kurt, of course, that is the famous year where he's coming to pit road at Homestead, and he does not hit the attenuator, and instead his right side tire goes off onto the racetrack to bring out a caution and save his championship hopes. Um, 
just one of those bizarre moments in NASCAR history where you're like, how did he not hit that attenuator right there? But yes, 20 years ago today, the Hendrick Motorsports plane crashed in Virginia, and I Still think about that every single time the NASCAR Cup Series goes back to Martinsville, especially if it's a cloudy day. It just is one of those things that's kind of engraved in your brain. I was uh, barely a teenager at that point, definitely a teenager, a teenager at that point. And uh, it's just one of those things where you just remember it. It's just always, you know, um, sort of burned into your brain. And it's just something you don't forget. So think about them next weekend when the NASCAR Cup Series heads to Martinsville. Tony Stewart went on Kevin Harvick's podcast this week and talked about a number of different things. Obviously, Stewart Haas Racing's run as a team is coming to an end with only a few races left on the NASCAR schedule, three to be exact. And in three weeks time, Stewart Haas Racing will cease to exist. Two NASCAR Cup Series championships and Xfinity Series championships, 70 NASCAR Cup Series wins, and they'll cease to exist in just a few weeks time. And of course, we'll continue on as a Haas factory team next season with a one car Cup Series operation and a two car Xfinity Series operation. But Tony Stewart went on to Kevin Harvick's podcast and he said some things. Tony basically was like, yeah, it's easy for people to sit at home on their mom's couch and criticize, you know, what they're doing here. And he's like, if you can do a better job, come down. And he's like, we are doing the best that we could. When talking about 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports and their lawsuit with NASCAR, he had this to say, quote, with their battle with NASCAR and the direction that things are going, it's not a direction that I want to be a part of. So I think a lot of this stems from some of the things that are in the charter agreement, the switch to the Gen 7 car, the lack of maybe ingenuity that goes into NASCAR cup cars in the old school sense of the way. Like you can still do things to cup cars, just not like you could uh, in years past, especially when you have fabricators and everything that went into that. And I just don't think Tony Stewart wants to be a part of that. He also talked about how hard it is to get sponsorships. He's like, before you were, um, you know, you had more Fortune 500 companies than you had cars in the field. And now he's like, you're battling for one and two race sponsorships. And it's become incredibly competitive and incredibly tough to fight for those marketing dollars. Tony then also says, quote, but as this year has gone on, this has become very clear that this is the right time for me to get out of the sport. There's things that I see that I definitely don't like, and I'm happy doing the stuff I'm doing now. I've always been somebody that's ran all kinds of different series. So yeah, it just sounds like Tony Stewart's time as a team owner has come and gone. It's been 16 years. And even he said it, a 16 year run is a really good run. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. Like I said, 70 NASCAR Cup Series wins, two championships in the Cup Series and one in the Xfinity Series. It certainly is nothing to be ashamed of at all. I think for a lot of fans watching Stuart Haas Racing go out the way that they did over the last few years where Tony was completely disconnected, Gene isn't coming to the track, and their performance just continually dropped. Of course, Chase Briscoe getting that win at the Southern 500 this year was monumental for that team. Not only did it get them a win and break like a 73 race winless streak for them, but it rejuvenated some of the hope over there. Because uh, you have a lot of people that have started to leave that organization that are checked out. Uh, they're not getting the same resources and the same, you know, things that they were getting in the past. And it's shown on track. Like those cars did have speed at the beginning of the year. And Noah Gragson and Josh Berry uh, look competitive. I mean, heck, Chase Briscoe, of course, went out there and won a race. But over the last few weeks, man, have those cars just really dropped off performance wise. And it's a real bummer to see them kind of go out this way. But for Tony Stewart, obviously, he's doing other things now. He's a full-time NHRA driver. He's about to start a family with his wife. He, of course, has a sprint car team. And just seems like his interests are in other places. And I don't fault him for that. Like, if he's not committed to being in NASCAR, then there's no sense in being in NASCAR. And there's no shame in that either. And I don't get why fans attack him for that. Maybe the way they went about announcing it could have been done uh, better. But for the most part, like, I always appreciate Tony Stewart's honesty. Uh, just, you know, bummer to see it kind of go out this way. John Four spoke publicly for the first time since his accident on June 23rd uh, in Richmond when he suffered a big time wreck and saw, ultimately suffered a traumatic brain injury coming out of that. He was hospitalized in Virginia and then moved to a long term care facility in Phoenix. Now it sounds like he is back home in California and he spoke to fans for the first time in a video, a two minute and 20 second video posted to the John Force Racing social accounts. And honestly, John looks good. He sounds just like John Force. Uh, you can clearly tell that like like there's 
you know, uh, a slight maybe memory loss there or um, just sort of disconnected because uh, there's obvious cuts in the video and stuff like that where he has to gather his thoughts and, and get on with it. But that's to be expected for sure. He did say, though, that he will be at the NHRA race in Las Vegas on November 1st through the 3rd, his first trip back to an NHRA race since he had his accident, which is a great step in the right direction. So if you want to watch that entire video, go ahead and head over to their social channels there. You can watch all two minutes and 20 seconds. I'm not going to put it in uh, here, but he, of course, is a 16-time NHRA champion, 157-time race winner. Are we ever going to see him back behind the wheel of a drag car? I don't think so. I know there's a lot of fans out there that want to see him make another pass. I just don't think with his age and the injury that he suffered, that would be a very good idea. And I certainly don't think he's going to get medical clearance to do that. He even in the video says that he is under strict orders from his doctors. They tell him what he can and cannot do, but they did approve him to go to the racetrack um, next weekend to watch that NHRA event in Las Vegas. So hopefully him returning to the racetrack is great. His cars are in contention for the championship. He wants to go out there and see his team, his team's win. And maybe that's that's just the motivating factor that they need to go out there. I mean, storybook, right? Everything that anybody wants to see. John Forrest making his triumphant return back to the racetrack to watch one of his cars go to victory lane and host a Wally uh, would be very cool to see. But overall, it's very cool to see John talking, John moving around back in California and headed back to the racetrack very soon. NASCAR has responded to the 2311 FRM request for an injunction by saying, quote, the court should deny the plaintiff's motion. NASCAR does not want to hear about this injunction going forward, and they kind of came out swinging in a 25-page document that was sent over to the court. In that document, NASCAR continues to talk about how they are preparing for the 2025 season with only 32 chartered teams, and how they've adjusted payouts, and how teams are um, in the planning process of being able to budget for those new increased payouts that they will be receiving. NASCAR, in their uh, response to the courts, says, quote, plaintiffs requested relief would cause harm to NASCAR and the 32 charter holders. Teams must budget for next season, and NASCAR needs to calculate and communicate to teams the prize money available for each race. NASCAR cannot simply reissue 2025 charters without affecting charter teams and the stakeholders, especially since plaintiffs' refusal to sign the 2025 charters increased prize amounts for charter and open teams alike. So that's NASCAR saying, hey, listen, you had your chance to be a charter team. Now you've elected to not be. We've went ahead and started the planning process here and communicated with teams what these increased payouts will be so that they can budget for next year. We are not going to give you these four charters back, and we do not think that you should be issued these four charters, or rather the injunction to continue to operate with this new charter agreement. NASCAR also goes on to say that 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports had two years during the contract or the charter negotiation period to bring up all the concerns that they have to address what they wanted to get done in this. And now only after other teams sign, have they decided to bring up this antitrust lawsuit not on merit, but rather to try to force NASCAR to give them what they want out of this as more of a negotiating tactic than anything. That's what NASCAR is saying. NASCAR even went as far in this response to quote their own legal cases, the one that they had against Kentucky Speedway years ago, where Kentucky Speedway was suing them on the basis of antitrust violations as well. NASCAR came out as the successor in that case, and NASCAR is basically telling 2311 and Front Row Motorsports and the courts, uh, honestly, here that there's no basis for this antitrust claim that 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports is bringing forward. NASCAR also goes on to say that 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports both signed that original 2016 charter agreement, or they signed it when they purchased those charters, uh, to join the sport. And part of that is a, a clause in there that says that you cannot sue them on the grounds of antitrust. Same thing with the 2025 charter agreement as well. NASCAR goes on to say, quote, Plaintiff's motion is a masterclass in contradiction. On one hand, plaintiffs, plaintiffs denounce the 2025 charter as anti-competitive, despite it being the product of collective negotiations by racing teams that secured guaranteed cups series race spots for a larger share of NASCAR's media revenue. On the other, plaintiffs seek the court's intervention to force NASCAR to offer plaintiffs 2025 charters so they can receive those exact same benefits, even though they rejected NASCAR's offer weeks ago. On top of that, plaintiffs ask the court to exercise Section 10.3, which provides NASCAR with a release from charter teams, but ignore Section 10.4, where NASCAR uh, reciprocally re uh, releases claims. Plaintiffs also ignore that they... Uh, 
that they agreed to the same release when acquiring 2016 charters and never objected to it during two years of the 2025 charter negotiations. These contradictions expose plaintiffs' motives to use this court to extract more money in better contractual terms from NASCAR. If this uh, injunction is so important, then they should have just signed the charter agreement. But now they want the benefits of having the charter, but without having to sign the charter agreement while they continue to try to litigate against NASCAR. And NASCAR's whole thing here is basically in layman terms, well, if it's not that good, then why do you actually want it then? Well, of course, because it comes with an increased monetary payout, and that's what the teams here would like to have. So it's going to be really interesting how a judge decides to uh, rule on this. That should happen on November 4th. The teams have requested an expedited discovery period um, by November 1st. We'll have to wait and see if that happens. But going forward, the two sides are certainly not seeing eye to eye on anything, and NASCAR is just not really willing to engage in any of this and continues to send strongly worded responses to the court um, in the tune of 25 pages this time around uh, uh, here. So let me know um, in the comments if you have anything like we talked about the house cleaning at the beginning of the show, the Hendrick Motorsports, um, you know, of course, tragedy that happened 20 years ago, Tony Stewart's comments, John Ford's headed back to the racetrack and NASCAR's strongly worded response to 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hardball.